Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Today is another extra special podcast. Uh, I have with me Dr. James Eglinton. Uh, Dr. Eglinton is the Meldrum Senior Lecturer in Reformed Theology at the University of Edinburgh. He is the author of several books, including Herman uh, Bavink on Preaching and Preachers, Trinity and Organism, Towards a New Reading of Herman Bavink's Organic Motif, and his latest book, Bavink, A Critical Biography. So in this episode, we're going to be looking to cover some of Bavink's organic motif and then discuss, discuss some particulars from Dr. Eglinton's new biography. So let's just jump right in. Uh, Dr. Eglinton, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Parker. It's great to be here. It's a real pleasure. Yeah, this is super fun. And the background finally worked out. They don't always work out, but we get uh, having to staring over at us, making sure we're yeah. not making any mistakes here. I like it. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, a lot of my listeners know I am an American swine. I pronounce things like an American. I say pensies instead of ponces. Uh, I say Herman <laughs> Bavink instead of what what I think is is Herman. Uh, Herman. 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 You have to Her roll the R a little bit. Herman. Her Herman, Herman. Herman. Bavink. Hitterman, yeah. and then it's it's Bavink, right? Or Bav Bavink, Bavink, yeah. Bavink, Bav. Yeah, okay. that's okay. Love covers a multitude of sins, also <laughs> with pronunciations, so don't stress about it. Okay, all right, I appreciate that. Uh, I just wanted to recount very briefly uh, how how did you get into to Bavink studies? Yeah, um, I mean, I fell into it in some ways um, when I was at seminary. Seems like many moons ago now. It was around the time that his dogmatics were coming out in English. And um, I discovered him there in our systematic theology class with mm -hmm. Donald McLeod, who would quote him sometimes. So I started to read him then. At that point, I was thinking about doing a PhD and um, was looking for a figure to work on as well. I wanted to do some kind of historical systematic theology. I didn't want to work on someone who'd written in English because I thought, if I do this degree, I'm only going to do this once. And I'd really like it to be a chance to pick up a new language. Um, I, I could already uh, read and speak French, so I was looking a little bit at, at Calvin, I thought a, a bit about some German language theologians as well. Um, but at that point, there weren't many people who were doing Dutch theology, so it seemed like something a bit different to work on. And um, so Bavink was really attractive, attractive to me for lots of different reasons. Um, and a few people who were quite influential in my life in different directions suggested to me working on him. So I got into it then and was really happy to do so. I've, I've never looked back and all these years on, I'm still working on Bavink and learning new things from him all the time. Yeah, well, well what a what a good thing for all of us that you chose uh, the Dutch instead of the French there. I'm sure your work on Calvin would have been great too, but uh, this is this has been huge. Someone even mentioned uh, on Twitter, they put out a, 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 they tweeted out a picture of, of Bavink and a picture of you and said, is, oh. is Dr. Eglinton turning into to Bavink? Is he actually turning? Because yeah. your, your facial hair is starting to resemble him. You... Yeah, it's true. It's <laughs> like when people look like their pets. It, it just <laughs> happens sometimes. So that's right. Uh, choose the figure you work on carefully. You, yeah. you, you morph into that person. <laughs> that's, that's a good tip. Yeah. Uh, so that brings us to the, the organic motif, which was uh, the subject of your of your dissertation which you turned into this book, Trinity and Organism Towards a New Reading of Herman Bavink's Organic Motif. And uh, I just wanted to, I think this is one of the things that makes uh, Bavink such a enormous, such a uh, influential and great systematician or dogmatician, however you want to parse that. But you you set out to battle this uh, two Bavink's uh, thesis. Mm -hmm. Can you just ex explain real quick uh, what that thesis is? Yeah, so it's a thesis that looks at Bavink's life and also his thoughts, and it tries to account for how Bavink's thought contains very strong and obvious elements of what we could call theologically orthodox Calvinism, mm -hmm. with the fact that he's also a thoroughly modern person, so engages with modern ideas, also thinks in quite modern ways in many regards. So how do you hold those two things together? And also in his own society and historical period, he is from an, quite a conservative church, um, but he's also engaged with all of the, the latest ideas and developments in the academy and in society. So how do you put those two things together. So the two Bavinks reading, which is what I discovered when I first got into Bavink studies was that quite a lot of people would write about him as a really dysfunctional figure intellectually, as though really what we're talking about is two Bavinks and two poles in Bavink's thoughts. 
and he's always pushed and pulled between them. And the idea is that for Bavink himself, he never really knew who he was mm. or which which crowd he wanted to belong to. Um, so what you find is then this two Bavinks picture being a, a Jekyll and Hyde kind of figure. And um, the, the way that, that, that it then was developed in terms of how to read Bavink was um, not unlike the kind of um, higher critical readings of say, the Old Testament that mm. some of your listeners might know of, where you know you see this one chapter of, of the Old Testament where uh, in this verse it talks about God as Elohim, but uh, further down the chapter it talks about Yahweh. So there's no way that one person could have written both of these verses, right? So we have to try and look for who the real authors were. And you actually find that with how people, some people wrote about Bavink. Mm. that they would look for some sections of his work and say that's the orthodox Bavink and some sections and say well that was the modern Bavink but there's not really one intellectual program that guides all of this so I pushed back quite hard against that um, the more I got into reading Bavink the more I started to think that there was probably a much better way to account for his theological program um, so the, and then the organic motif was what I think I came across that, that showed well, it showed me anyway how to put Bavink back together theologically and um, helped me see that really the two Bavinks way of reading him was really fruitless in many different respects, but also it just wasn't the right understanding of what he was all about theologically. Yeah, well, so with that in mind, you know, uh, it, it seemed to me, reading reading you, reading some other folks on, on Bavink, that that the two Bavinks uh, motif or, or uh, uh, thesis was so prominent at the time how did you ever even come to saying, uh, you know, no, I'm going to trace this organic motif? You know, it, it seems like it was kind of you against the world there. Yeah. Um, so in the UK um, university system, when you're doing your PhD, you you have to have a research proposal that you get into the program with and that, that sets you up in a particular discipline. But then you have the first year to try and work out, is that definitely what you want to work on? Or you know, do you want to refine your focus and or move to a different kind of topic? So when I applied in the first place, it was to work on Bavink and to work on Bavink's eschatology. So I was just interested in eschatology mm. in general in that phase. And um, But fairly soon after starting in the program, um, I discovered that there was a, a guy in Aberdeen, Brian Matson, who was doing a PhD on Bavink. And it was on Bavink's protology so the doctrine of first things mm -hmm. but Bavink's protology is inherently very eschatological and, and the title of Bavink's book it's a really uh, the, the title of Brian's book I should say it's a really great book is restored to our destiny mm -hmm. and it's this idea that eschatology actually uh, or God's work in, in recreating the, the fallen disorder creation is restoring it to the destiny that it had at the very beginning and, and how that works in Bavinck's thought. So I discovered, oh, there's someone else who's working on eschatology, also in Scotland even, <laughs> and, and Bavinck. And then I discovered also that, uh, that there was a chap in, in Canada, uh, Sid Helema, who'd also written a dissertation on Bavinck and eschatology a bit further back, uh, but that hadn't been published, and that's why I hadn't come across it when I was trying to read around secondary literature on Bavinck before. So fairly early on in the program, I discovered that there are already at least two works on Bavinck and eschatology do I, do, as, as a third work, what we really need, given that there's so much unexplored terrain. So I basically used the rest of that first year just to get back into primary sources and read Bavinck really widely and just to look for things that were interesting and things that I thought were neglected. And the more I read him, the more I discovered how often he talks about things using organic imagery and explicitly organicist language. And for me, that was really exciting and interesting because it was such a, a regular feature of his thoughts. And I actually thought I could start to see patterns and how and why he was using it. So then I started to read around secondary literature to find, has anyone written on this? And discovered that there was a really significant Dutch work by Jan Feinhoff uh, called Revelation and Inspiration um, that had a particular way of understanding the organic motif. And also, you know, that it's a it's a book that deals with the, the two Bavinks idea as well and talks about the two Bavinks and the two poles in his thought. So the more I read his work, and it's a really huge tome, it's like 600 and something pages. Uh, and which was Dutch? Good, yeah, which was good for my Dutch. Yeah. <laughs> um, I discovered that actually I thought I, I read Bavink and understood him quite differently. So I thought we can have a really interesting conversation here. And um, I guess what I was very keen to do with, with working on Bavink for my doctorate was if I could to try and say something that was maybe paradigmatic in its significance for Bavink studies mm -hmm. and how we read Bavink, 
um, because there was just so much about him that no one had written on. Um, so when I was working on my PhD and, and thinking about beforehand about doing a PhD, um, the huge thing in Edinburgh was BART studies. And mm -hmm. anyway, there, there are so many dissertations on BART and yeah. um, just a, a lot of the, the most centrally important work on how to read BART, you know, the really paradigmatic stuff has been done. And it's quite hard to position yourself within that, with that kind of scholarship in a figure who's who's so heavily studied like Bart to try and say something that's not a bit peripheral or you know of tertiary significance. Whereas I thought for Bavink, there is so much scope to do that, and that's one of the things that attracted me to write on him. So the more I got into reading and trying to understand his organic thinking, the more I realized that I thought this is actually hugely significant, um, paradigmatically significant for how he understands um, God and the world in relation to God. So um, Trinity and Organism was really just the project that developed out of that. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So can you uh, continue on that, that train of thought and explain uh, the, the organic motif as, as you've recounted it in your book? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So I think the organic motif is, it's a distinctively Bavinkian um, way of thinking about theology and thinking about God in the world, but it's actually part of a much bigger Christian tradition. It's this classically Christian idea that you find um, articulated so clearly in, in Aquinas or in Augustine before that, um, that, that theology is thinking about God and then thinking about everything else in the light of God. And that includes also how we think about co the cosmos and the world in which we live as the general revelation of God. So the organic motif is, is Bavink's way of doing that, I think. Um, it's Bavink's way of talking about the world, the, the cosmos, um, in all of its complexity, and also in how it all holds together as one thing. Bavink's way of talking about all of that in the light of who and what God is in the Christian tradition. Um, so for Bavink, the most theologically appropriate way to talk about the world and things within it is to rely on organicist language because that's the created um, way of being that most appropriately reveals what it is for God to be God, what kind of a God is God. So for, I mean, Baving's very committed to classical Trinitarianism and, you know, as, as a thoroughly Orthodox Christian on that front. Mm -hmm. So for Baving, God is not some kind of undifferentiated monad, um, or you know, just some kind of divine being that has never disclosed anything of of, it, of itself. And in fact, what we have in, in the Christian faith is this richly trinitarian account of God as these three persons, one Godhead, one divine essence. And yet, there's a lot of diversity within the Godhead in terms of you know, for Bavink, there are attributes, the names of God, as well as uh, you know, very centrally the, the the three persons of the Godhead and their distinct works as well. So Bavink has a very rich doctrine of God, and what he wants to see is, um, is how the world, as the general revelation of God, is the general revelation of that specific God, and not just some kind of vague God concept. Mm -hmm. um, and then that leads Bavink then to understand the world as being like one giant organism. It's one thing that's made up of many parts, and the parts are diverse. And yet they all function together for a common goal, and there's a there's a unity that they presuppose together as well. So it's a paradigmatic way of of understanding the world in the first place. So it's a kind of theologically charged uh, cosmology, and not a cosmology in the kind of scientific sense, but uh, you know, a cosmology in terms of um, ontology and and ethics and purpose and vocation. Um, so that's why then Bavink uses the language of the organic. To talk about the, the cosmos on a, on a truly um, macrocosmic level, but also microcosmically. So, with it, with it, um, within this reality that God has created, there are lots of things that, in their different ways, generally reveal the the, the its triune creator through their their own examples of being um, diverse things that are united together. So when Bavink wants to talk that kind of a language, to talk about how the triune God is revealed in the world, and for Bavink, the, the creation does reveal the Trinity in a general way, that's where you find him making uh, recourse to organicist language and organic motifs. And you find that actually um, just throughout his, his dogmatics and actually throughout his life, it's, it's a really common recurrent motif. But my argument was that it was Bavink trying to learn how to talk about the world and think about the world in ways that, that 
point to it, um, its triune creator and ways that glorify its triune creator. So it's not a kind of like pantheism or panentheism or something like that. Um, it's it's a very theologically charged motif for Bavink. Yeah, and it it, uh, it definitely. I'm so glad that you worked on this instead of uh, eschatology. Not that that's not important, but like you said, it's it's paradigmatic, mm. and it's been so helpful for me because I was primed in a lot of Vantilian thought and I was studying Van Til a lot and then seeing, oh, he just, he's getting this from, from Bavink, whether he's changing it or not is another uh, conversation to have, whether he read oh. Bavink rightly, but that, uh, that motif just finally hit for me. And I saw, oh, the world is like an organism, not like a mechanism. So it's, it's yeah. a, as opposed to like a bunch yeah. of gears working together. Mm. No, it's more like a, an animal or it's more like a, a thing, mm. an organism. And and, you know, I yeah. think back to like David Hume saying, why isn't, what if the world's like a big carrot? And it's like mm. having just been like, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> but, but yeah, it represents yeah. It's, its unity in diversity. Mm. Uh, like there's unity in diversity in the Godhead mm. that, that God is one and God is triune. Yeah. And, and I guess, yeah, it's very really helpful that you bring up the mechanical alternative and that's very much the, like the philosophy of the day and the, also the theology of the day that Bavink was schooled in as a student at the University of Leiden. Um, there's a very determinist mechanical mm -hmm. uh, uh, imagining of reformed theology as well, um, where the world is really just one giant machine and we are cogs. And um, it's a way of thinking about the world that Bavink thought doesn't do justice to to its creator or even just the, the nature of, of the world and life within it. Um, it's not a way of thinking about the world that enables you to do the kind of like the protology, the first things are all or, or the eschatology and the telos, the goal for for which the world exists. You can't do any of that justice, really. Having thought, if you rely on mechanical explanations, you know, in a reductionist kind of way, um, you know, Bavink wasn't against um, you know like cause and effect as a reality in the world, for example. But there's so much more that the Bavink thought organicist ways of trying to account for for the world um, has to offer. Yeah, well, you've also given us a uh, a model for uh, for for titles for uh, subheadings. Uh, Trinity ad intra leads to organism ad extra, or organic mm. uh, cosmology, or you know, Gray takes it up and and mm. organic knowing, and mm. so Trinity ad intra leads to organic organicism or organism yeah. uh, ad extra, and so yeah. that's getting at the the fact that ad intra. God is Trinitarian. He's he's uh, there's unity and diversity within the Godhead. He's one and three, and mm. then instead of trying to find like triangles out in reality as like this mm. vestigia trinitatis, this fingerprints of the Trinity, mm. instead we we look to find unity and diversity. Mm. Yeah, indeed. So I think such a key concern for Bavink is in trying to think in, in explicitly and intentionally Trinitarian ways about the creation rather than the Creator he's still very careful to guard the true uniqueness of the, this three in one way of being that can only pertain to God. I mean, that, that for Bavink is, you know, the, the, like the kind of triadic formula that people have looked for in the creation. You know, if you think about medieval theology mm -hmm. where you know, everyone's out there looking for um, three in one things in the world as evidences of how God could be three in one. I mean, for Bavink, that whole quest is a question in vain because only the Trinity can be like this. And yet nonetheless, the triune God practices self-revelation and, and, and reveals uh, himself generally by creating the world. So there has to be some sense in which the Trinity, the triunity of God is revealed in the world. So what Bavink wants to do is find a way to explain how everything can be like God, but God is still, the triune God is still unlike everything else. Yeah. And I think that for him, that's where the, the organicist idea um, is, is so useful. And that's why he takes it up. You know, it's the language of the day in f uh, philosophy and biology and so on, but he really theologizes it. Mm -hmm. um, but he does so because it really serves his purpose as well in guarding the unity, uh, uh, and guarding the uniqueness, I should say, of what it means for God to be triune, but nonetheless, what it means for the world to be the general revelation of that God. Um, so yeah, he's not at all interested in trying to find three in one patterns or, you know, if he lived today, he like wouldn't be using fidget spinners as an analogy of the <laughs> Trinity or something like that, or, you know, trying to argue from like water existing in different states or, you know, any of those kind of heretical analogies, obviously, but um, I guess a key contribution that he makes to Trinitarian theology in relation to general revelation is that 
the Trinity is revealed in the bare principle of unity and diversity, and that's a non-numerical uh, way to think about it. You know, it's not tied to three and one, but it's the fact that the God who's revealed in the creation is not a monad, and therefore the creation is not a monad either, something else. And it looks like its creator, resembles its creator, because um, because of who and what its creator is. So he, uh, something that's so interesting with Bavinck is that he resurrects the language of Bestigia Trinitatis in Reformed theology, because it's not something that Reformed theology is widely known for. It's more of a kind of common, you know, medieval or older kind of back to Augustine emphasis. Uh, I mean, amongst the first generation of Reformed theologians, um, it's really uncommon. I think Pierre Viret is, is one of the very few who's comfortable with talking in that language of there being vestiges of the Trinity in the world. Mm. Um, but then it's much later in the Reformed tradition when Bavinck comes along and is really comfortable with the language because he's got a different way of thinking about them, the Trinity as revealed generally. Yeah. Well, that's so exciting for me because, again, like, like I was studying uh, Van Til and, and all the, the things kind of fell into place, studying philosophy and looking at the problem of the one and the many, looking at the problem of unity and diversity, looking at, uh, you know, abstract and concrete, and then seeing, uh, yeah, that, that would make sense that we would have this problem if we're looking at general revelation and not acknowledging a God who is who has unity and diversity ad intra. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you don't look out at, at uh, creation and look at the, the Trinity River or three frozen, you know, mm -hmm. things and say, oh, that God must be triune. But mm -hmm. you say, oh, there's this unity and diversity problem that we have in the world that, mm -hmm. that, affects every area, every area of study. It affects our politics. It affects our racial reconciliation when yeah. people try to be just uh, uh, smash over diversity for the sake of yeah. unity and yeah. uniformity instead of uh, unity and diversity. Yeah. We get all these problems. Oh, that makes sense if we're made by this triune creator. And so yeah. we don't have to take three of us and uh, yeah, exactly what you're saying. Yeah. We don't have to try and, you know, proof text from creation, a threeness, yeah. but we yeah. do find in general revelation, a God who has revealed himself in unity and diversity. Yeah. Which is so, so exciting to me. I love that. I think there's so much more there too for philosophy of religion kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm hoping to, uh, I'm hoping to work on that myself, um, but I'm hoping others will too, which kind of brings me to this, this revolution that you've started, this bobbing uh, revolution over in Edinburgh there. Uh, you got, uh, you know, Gray just worked on uh, epistemology, uh, Corey's, Corey's looking at uh, his book is Orthodox yet Modern and Bob Bevink's mm -hmm. use of uh, uh, Schleiermacher. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Greg's working on the ethics. Mm -hmm. are you, are you, is this intentional? Are you intentionally working through every different field or is it just kind of happenstance? Um, I mean, it's really, it's more of a, a Bavink reformation than a revolution, obviously, because Bavink <laughs> preferred reformation to revolution <laughs> in principle. Yeah, I've just been blessed to be able to work with some some really first class students, um, you know, who, who've read Trinity and Organism, who don't all agree with all of it, and you know, some aspects have pushed back against it, um, and that's absolutely fine. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I it was, it was fun to to have to revisit it myself for this podcast because you know, I wrote some of it in like two thousand and eight, so yeah. it wasn't yesterday. And I think I look back on it and think I would do some of it quite differently now. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it was a book that was based on my doctoral thesis and, um, you know, you develop as a thinker over the years. But I think that what, they, what my students have taken really seriously, which I'm pleased with, is this call for a fresh perspective on, on Bavink and not to read him with, you know, lenses that assume the Jekyll and Hyde thing at all, but to give him a chance to speak on his own terms as one thinker, as a united thinker. So certainly my students have all done that, and um, current students are doing that as well, and just approaching the sources without those presuppositions. I think that's been really helpful and liberating and intellectually really thrilling, because what we see is actually that each of these dissertations is like a piece in a jigsaw. And when you put them all together, we start to see, whoa, Bavink was really interesting mm -hmm. and really complex and has so much to say to us today. Um, so I have other students working on uh, just some fascinating topics at the moment on Bavink and piety, um, on, as you said, Greg's working on Bavink and ethics. Um, 
of a student who's just about to defend his thesis, Cam Clausing on Bavinckan history. So how did he understand the, the development of the discipline of history as an academic subject in the 19th century? And then how does that affect the ways that Bavinck then went on to think about doctrine within history and how doctrine keeps on developing into the future? Um, so there's there's a lot that's happening here. And um, I you know I just, I love being a part of it. It's, it's such a thrilling part of, of, I guess, my vocation in life is to work with these students. and help you know equip them with reading skills and Dutch language and try and guide them through the sources but also i i just i learn a tremendous amount from each of them from their dissertations from the research um so yeah i'm really happy in, in the work that i get to do in that regard yeah and all the rest of us are being completely blessed by all the the work in that's coming out of edinburgh there we need i don't know if there's already a name for it i know there's some names that you've shot back down <laughs> but i won't mention here but yeah, there's there's the the, Bob, the Bavink uh, uh, Reformation or something. We got to mm. figure that out and put a name on it. Mm. Uh, what's so interesting to me is that Bavink was. What, is it fair to call him a polymath? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think really appropriate. Yeah, he he had his fingers in a lot of pies, and so he's mm. just this huge figure that you can study from different angles. And mm. what I'm I am excited to see the jigsaw puzzle coming together. Mm. But uh, you wrote this this biography. <clears throat> Bavink, a critical biography, uh, it just came out, and it's crazy. It, it's it's so good. But you, you are a theologian, and you wrote a biography. Was that was there any kind of fear and trepidation there? Was there a, a big learning curve in in moving from? Uh, you you already did some bio, biographical work in your dissertation, mm -hmm. but was this a, a new step? Did you have to acquire new tools, or how did that go for you? Um, I had to acquire a lot of new knowledge, um, you know, because my my doctoral work was very much on Bavink the theologian and not uh, Bavink the, the or his theology and not so much the theologian, I should say. Mm. Um, and that had a biographical um, like yearning within it to to try and like set out a biographical claim that this isn't Jekyll and Hyde, this is Herman Bavink. Right. And um, but it, I guess I'd I'd done quite a bit of historical. Uh, work throughout my studies and that I did my undergrad training in law um, before I went on to seminary. Um, you, you do legal history and, and you learn the basic tools of historical writing and historical investigation. And then, um, you know, at seminary, I, you know, church history kind right. of helps you keep on developing those skills as part of my training there. And um, yeah, so... Uh, and I think I acquired quite a lot of the skills that I needed in conversation with George Harrink. Mm. He's a professor at the Free University of Amsterdam and also in Kampen. And um, I did my, my postdoc there with him. Uh, so I had spent three years in the Netherlands after my PhD working with him and uh, talking with him regularly um, about how to just go about writing historical theology. And even though I had a PhD in it, uh, just having regular time with with a real master of of uh, of church history and historical study um, was just such a huge privilege. So he really, uh, I guess, pushed me to sharpen up uh, my historical skills in lots of ways and um, was also a, a very helpful uh, reader of, of the book as the book was developing, uh, gave lots of feedback. And um, so, I mean, I think, you know, the way that I understand the academic discipline that I've been in thus far in my work um, systematic theology and historical theology really overlap and you know there's a big gray area between the two um and if, if it were a venn diagram you know i would be somewhere right in the middle <laughs> like not obviously in, in one of the two I'm, I'm very happy to move in both um but i think that's a that's a really good thing and it's and it's how i was trained in how to become a systematic theologian here at edinburgh with david ferguson um, who encouraged me very much not to work on systematic theology and abstraction, mm. but instead first to learn my trade from a, you know, a great dead theologian, go and read someone's works, try and do it as exhaustively as you can, try and then trace out how you think their thoughts work and how they join all of these dots, and then learn to think like them as, a, as an exercise in following, else, uh, following someone else and how they do systematics in the first place. So, you know, it, it was systematic theology, but it was also um, systematic theology in, in a historical context and with a historical figure. So I think that was a, a really great kind of training that I'm very thankful to have received because it you know, means that I can hopefully do some something useful in talking about doctrine, uh, but also something useful in being able to have a more historically focused work like the biography. 
Well, I, I think that sounds like a perfect place to be. And just like you said, yeah, there's this this overlapping kind of gray area in the middle and the, the, the gray area is a nice spot to be. I think just like you had mentioned also, that's that's where Bevink lived. He was Orthodox mm -hmm. yet modern. He could pull from Augustine. He's mm -hmm. putting in Greek and Hebrew. If you read through the dogmatics, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of different languages in there. Uh, but then he's applying it to to today. And he's mm -hmm. applying it in various lecture series that have turned into books, you know, Philosophy of Revelation and the Christian... Uh, worldview or just Christian worldview, and I—that's I, what I think is so fantastic about him. And I'm so excited that that you're not only following along in his looks, but in uh, in in doing theology uh, systematic systematically and historically. Um, but you have spent all this time fighting against this two Bavinks motif or uh, uh, thesis, two Bavinks thesis, only to bring it back and give us a new one, a new two oh. Bavinks. The uh, the young Bavink and the mature Bavink. Is that is that right? Is yeah, that yeah, that's how I would call it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, can you um, just uh, a quick sketch for maybe someone who ha we've been talking about Bavink a lot already? But can you give us just a brief sketch of, of who this guy was? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So he was born in the middle of the nineteenth century in 1854 in the Netherlands. He was born into a, a theologically pretty conservative church that had left the mainstream Dutch Reformed Church. Um, in 1834, and um, he lived a really fascinating life. Um, he was a theologian, he was a pastor, he did all kinds of different things. He was a journalist, a national newspaper editor, he was a Bible translator, um, he was a travel writer, a biographer, he was a pretty terrible poet. Um, so he did all of these things, and he died in 1921. So he's, he's really worth reading because he's a very thoughtful Christian who lived through some of the most interesting decades in recent history between the late 19th and early 20th century. So if you follow his own story as one historical actor, um, it's it's a really interesting window into just uh, it, you know, decades for society and, and the Western world changes so dramatically. Um, so it's a fascinating period to look at someone in, but he's a really interesting person to look at because as you say, he is a polymath. He can, he can justly be called that, I think, because his life is one of intellectual endeavor in lots of different directions, but also, you know, vocational endeavor with all the all of the different social roles that he fulfills. Um, so as a polymath in that kind of a context, what you actually see is that, you know, the, those decades have so many interesting currents that are all flowing. And because he is a polymath, you know, by intellectual persuasion and character and everything, all of those currents flow into him. And then he turns them all into something. So he, he's a kind of, like he, he encapsulates his age, but puts it through a process of Christianization, if that makes sense. And then mm -hmm. what you get is the output of Herman Bavink's writings and life example. Um, and yeah, so within that, he's a reformed theologian who tries to push reformed theology forward into the 20th century and, and, and doing a really admirable job of it. So um, as I said, he died in 1921 um, in a very different world to the one that he was born into. Yeah. Yeah. Um there's so many, there's so many trails I want to follow, but there's a, uh, there's this word. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. It looks like uh dag, dag book. Dag book. Dag yeah. book. Okay. It's actually the day book. Yeah. So a journal. And and so you were just scouring through these journals and that's why you can yeah. say, yeah, he wasn't the best poet maybe. Yeah. Uh, so his, his poetry is in his journals and um, it varies in quality, but um, yeah, he was a, a kind of young romantic soul anyway, when he was trying to write his poetry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, young romantic soul, and that that would be like the 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 young Bavink or Bavink, um, and maybe I don't want to psychologize the guy too much, but this this you recount this um, this love for Amelia Den Decker, hmm. uh, is that right? Is it Decker or something? Decker, Decker? yeah, Amelia Den Decker. Yeah. And this was horrible. This was like so sad. Yeah, yeah. It, it was. It led to an unsuccessful marriage proposal, hmm. and then she remained unmarried, and then just died at the age of eighty four. Yeah. Do you, can you just recount like wh why why did you put that in the book? I guess that was super sad. I, I really enjoyed yeah. it. But uh, what 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 significance did this um, this love unrequited love for her have for him? Yeah, yeah. That, those are great questions. Um, I put it in the book because it's a critical biography. So you, if you're a critical biographer, you're not commemorative. It's not hagiography. You go and open up the sources and find what, what's there. And then you try and put it together yeah. and present what the sources will tell you. And I guess that's something about being a, 
a critical biographer as a with that as a genre is that you're open to things that you know might not per portray your figure in a flattering light necessarily but you have to say what's there mm. not that i think the amelia story is unflattering i think but i think it's how could i not put it in the book when i discovered it so it's not something that's in any of the previous biographies so it was an unknown story but it's so biographically significant to him because um he was really uh, in love with her from his teenage years until the age of 31 but he never married her um, because her father wouldn't give permission and that was legally necessary mm. um, in Dutch culture at that point. So he was really powerless without the father giving consent. And then eventually, you know, under Dutch law, you would have the opportunity of marrying without parental permission, but it was very controversial. So he didn't want to do that. And you only have three chances to ask as well. well um, and, you know, as a young adult, so, you know, you don't want to blow those chances and, you know, use them all up too quickly. Um, but you know, this is a shadow that that was there hanging over his life for you know a decade and a half of his young life, and um, the future that he imagined was that he would marry Amelia, and, and that was what life was going to look like. So he didn't want to be single. He really struggled with his singleness, and you know, was a like an unmarried young pastor who found that very very difficult, and who really wanted to be married, just to have a friend and a confidant mm. uh, who who saw him as Herman and, and not just as you know Reverend Bavink. Yeah. Um, but I think what was biographically significant and also uh, theologically significant about it is that he channeled that singleness into uh, just amazing amounts of reading and writing, and it's really the singleness that circumstantially gives them the time to write the dogmatics. I mean, you can't write a four volume work like that overnight or, you know, without a lot of time to read. And um, so the, the Amelia story is, is actually there in the background circumstantially is one of the reasons that we have the reform dogmatics. Yeah. So it was, it was amazing that it hadn't been told before by previous biographers. Um, what he writes about her in his journals is, is in Latin as well. So to keep it a bit more secret, mm. um, and um, I guess I, my theory on why the previous biographers didn't mention it is that the woman he did eventually marry, and it was a very happy marriage, uh, she was younger than he was by some way, and outlived him by quite some time as well. And his daughter, you know, um, lived well into the 20th century. So if you know, if you discover when you read the the Dach book in the journals that there's this really dramatic and sad love story with who he wanted to marry first, you'd have to be pretty brazen as, as a biographer to bring that story out and tell it to the world when you have either his widow or his daughter still around. So yeah. I think in that regard, you know, as a biographer, I had much more freedom to tell the story that the sources will let you tell because, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I'm not Dutch. Uh, you know, it's a generation on, um, but, you know, I do have access to all of those sources and could put the story together. Yeah, but it makes him seem so. You just see how human he was, you know. Seriously, his heart could be broken. He could be totally in love and be disappointed and sad. Yeah, he was a real a real person. You know, mm -hmm. he. Uh, I think it's probably due to the way that they took pictures back then. But he always got the stern look. He's looking at us right now, and you yeah. think like this is a, a rigorous thinker. This is a stern man. You know, you you accidentally. Uh, talk about uh infra or super lapsarianism in the wrong way and he's gonna get you and mm. um but he's a he's a human who was in love and had this unrequited love all those rules are so crazy to to our modern ears that you can only try three times and stuff like that mm. so so fascinating and interesting um and and i'm really glad that you included it it's a little bit sad to think that like it's sad it's god's sovereignty right and uh, but mm. We are benefiting but, from yeah. his misery, right? Like we we get all these things because he was alone and single, and God had yeah. him in a period of waiting. It, mm. it worked out well for him eventually, but it's like, yeah, we it only did. Uh, and you know, Johanna, uh, uh, you know, the wife, well, the woman he eventually married was a much better fit, mm. um, as far as we can tell. You know, she was she was really well matched with him intellectually and um, in terms of cultural interests and. So we actually know quite a bit about Amelia Dendecker's family, uh, just mm. because that, like this secession movement they were a part of, is very well documented from its period, mm. and and we know actually a surprising amount about her father as well. And um, it's really hard to imagine someone who temperamentally was more different from Herman Bavink huh. in lots and lots of ways. And to me, it's not a surprise that he didn't that he wasn't that happy, you know, for this young intellectual theologian at a liberal university, even though he himself was orthodox to marry his daughter. Yeah. You know, he was a farmer, Bavink had no interest in farming, um, and was really drawn to high culture and that agriculture. 
Um, so the, the, those two families were really mismatched, even though they came from the same church uh, in terms of outreaks on the modern world. And um, whereas Bavink and, and his eventual in-laws were a really, really happy combination. So I think it worked out yeah. very well for, for, for him in the end. And okay. uh, it was a very fruitful marriage intellectually for him. We don't have to feel bad about about reading the dogmatics mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, yeah. see God's sovereignty there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So there's uh, something so interesting that all of the American readers, uh, everyone should find interesting, but American readers should find is, uh, is Bavinck's um, understanding of, of America. And, you know, initially when you think of this young versus mature Bavinck, you might think the young is this brash guy and the old one uh, has all of his corners cut off. And uh, I think it's partially true. He's mature, but in his characterization of America, first he was saying, you know, don't, he was against immigration uh, from from uh, the Netherlands to America because he thought that Americans were Armenians and could never receive Calvinism. I'm, I'm uh, paraphrasing, probably butchering this, but then secondly, he said, uh, "Don't don't immigrate." After he was maybe more in the mature mode of thinking, because of this inherent, uh, uh, because America was built on slavery and racism, and without a transformation. A transformational work of the gospel, the American project was going to collapse. Is that? Is that? I know it's super uh, brash. Yeah, yeah. No, in a nutshell, I mean that's yeah, that's that's kind of the story, really. So when he first went to America, he was uh, anti-emigrationist. Um, well, I guess for a couple of reasons. I mean, his family were anti-emigrationist anyway, and they believed very strongly that regardless of the persecution that you face in your own country, and you know, they came from a church that was persecuted by their states in really mm -hmm. severe ways. Um, so regardless of that, you have a duty to stay and not abandon your own country to unbelief. Um, so, you know, you should stay and, and fight the good fight where you come from mm -hmm. and not move to the new world and, you know, have an easier life there to, to live out your, your religious ideals. So he was against it for that reason, but also he was against it, um, or he, he encouraged young reformed people from the Netherlands not to emigrate because he thought America is just not receptive to reform theology. And it's, just, it's all about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps right. in culture, but also in, in your relationship to God as well. And, and the, the kind of um, you know monergistic way of thinking in Calvinism where it's all about what God does to save you. And you know you respond in gratitude, but you don't contribute anything. You thought that was a really un-American way to think about what the gospel is. Um, but yeah, when he came back to America later in life, um, it was really no holds barred afterwards when he went to the Netherlands to give very critical commentary on America. And he contemplated openly that the American experiment would fail um, because of um, uh, because of racialized hatred and. Um, so yeah, it was the case of don't move to America, not because you'll end up being Arminian, um, but um, because you know you could be about to step into a, a kind of collapse of society uh, and a violent collapse as well. Yeah, and and once again, uh, reading this this uh, theologian from a hundred years ago is uh, he's he's very prescient. Uh, yeah. We might be on the on the verge of a civil war right now, uh, so we should have read him sooner. I guess we should have had it translated over sooner. Uh, there's this relationship that that Bavinck has to Leiden and Compen and uh, the Free University. Um, I want to trace that down, but not at the expense of getting into uh, Nietzsche. So, um, can you just briefly explain, like like Leiden and Compen and that relationship between you know Orthodox and, and modern, maybe, and then get into uh, we can get into his his time at the university, the Free University. Yeah, sure. So Leiden um, is a beautiful city in the Netherlands. Um, it was the scene of the Netherlands most, or the site of the Netherlands most prestigious university, and um, it's where Bavinck studied. And you know, it's really like where the sons of the elite would go. Um, mm -hmm. And it, you know, when he was a student, you know, it was a country of like three point something million people with you know, maybe 1,200 university students. So almost nobody went to university. So if you were there, I think you were truly in this tiny sliver of the upper elite of society. Um, the theological faculty was, um, uh, it was called the modern theology in terms of their school of thought. And it was um, an anti-supernatural um, materialist, a kind of science-led approach to theology where, you know, there's no miracle, there's no divine self-revelation. We study the Bible as a human text by human authors. And um, 
Christianity is a phase of the evolution of society of civilization, mm -hmm. but we've now reached civilization and we've become truly enlightened. So going forward, we don't need Christianity anymore. Yeah. Um, so instead, we're we're approaching a new phase of, of some kind of civilization and enlightenment. Um, so and their approach to theology was to try and reread, especially reformed texts. Um, to argue that actually the, the Reformation points forward to this. So they would latch on to like Calvin and predestination and say that really the point Calvin was getting towards was um, cause and effect and the mechanical determinism as the, the way that the world works. So, you know, they would teach you, or, um, you know, if you pray and ask for things from God, that's ridiculous um, because, uh, and it's selfish as well, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, why would God change anything in this great pattern of cause and effect? You're just a cog in the wheel. Instead, mm -hmm. when you pray, it should always be a prayer of submission to cause and effect and to this big machine that we're all a part of. Um, so that was Leiden, where Bavink studied um, at least one aspect of, of how we could describe it. Um, Campen is a, is a smaller city in the Netherlands, a small town, and it's where his church had its seminary. And um, uh, so it was a much, much smaller place. It wasn't prestigious, it wasn't accredited. And um, he studied there for a year, but actually before he went to study in Leiden, but it, it couldn't give him the kind of modern scientific training in theology with all of the rigor involved that, that he wanted at that point in life. Um, but it's where he went back to teach. And um, um, so he taught there for a couple of decades in the 1880s and 90s before he moved to the Free University. While he was teaching there, um, this young upstart called Abraham Kuyper started to make really big waves in theology and in the Dutch Reformed Church. So he began as a liberal, he'd under like he'd experienced the pietistic conversion, and then he'd started to use Reformed theology in a new way that wasn't what they were doing in Leiden. So he was he was much more orthodox, but also very modern as well in lots of his instincts and the kind of social program he had for what you do with Reformed theology. So Baving then comes into Kuiper's orbit in these decades and um, uh, becomes what we could call a Kuyperian, I guess, in that phase of life, or you know what later people call a neo-Calvinist. So he gets really on board with this modern Calvinist project. Um, and then eventually he moved to teach at the Free University, which was a university founded by Abraham Kuyper. Um, to be a new reformed university that was fit for the modern age, but that led the way in terms of Christian thinking or specifically reformed thinking as applied to each area of life. Mm. Uh, so, you know, you would go there to study law, but it would be a kind of Christianized approach to law, or you would study philosophy and it would be uh, reformed philosophy, or, you know, you would study like literature, but it's, it's from a Christian uh, perspective and also theology. Okay. No, that's that's you did a great job of. of so that's of, like a long part of the book in a nutshell. Um, but if you want to know more, obviously read the book. Yeah, read the book. Yeah, that was amazing. Uh, one writer, I'm not sure if I got this from your book or, or Gray's book, uh, depicted uh, Bavink as like Abraham Kuyper's theological henchman. I thought that was such a great line. Yeah, I mean it's it's wrong. It's um, but it's a great line. So it's, it's not by Gray or by me. It's by um, a guy called. Um, it was James Hutton Mackay, I think. Uh, you, who, one of you quoted it, him. Yeah, so I quoted it, okay. um, and, and Gray may have as well. Um, so he was a Scottish theologian who went to the Netherlands and spent some time there and then came back to Scotland and gave some lectures on Dutch theology at the beginning of the 20th century. So yeah, he described Bavink as Kuiper's, I think, learned and loyal theological henchman, which is not at all how the relationship worked, even as theologians. Um, actually, I think so. I've, I have a chapter in a, in a book that's about to come out, the Oxford Handbook to the Reception of Aquinas. And mm -hmm. my chapter there is on Aquinas and Kuiper's thought. And um, what I argue there is that for Kuiper, um, the history of theology has two distinct kinds of genius. Um, so there are genius individuals who are what Kuiper called gold diggers, and in the kind of historic going underground sense, you know, someone who has a genius of perception, they mm. can enter a dark mine shaft and they can see this tiny glimmer of gold in a rock. Mm -hmm. So they, they have a genius of spotting that and having a key insight. But it's a different kind of genius um, who becomes the goldsmith, you know, who takes the piece of the kind of raw nugget of gold and who crafts it into something intricate and beautiful. Mm. And Kuiper himself recognized that there were two kinds of genius like that. And I think that the way that Kuiper and Bavink relate is like the goldsmith. Uh, with Bavink as the, as the goldsmith and Kuiper as the gold digger. So Kuiper has key insights about reformed principles and reformed thinking. But Kuiper himself, I think, and this is a bit tentative, but I think this is right, was looking for um, someone who would work those insights into something like a kind of neo-Calvinist summa, 
um, yeah. and that's Bavinck's Reform Dogmatics. So Bavinck's role quite often is to nuance Kuiper's thoughts and sometimes to correct it, mm. um, or sometimes to explain to the public that you know even if Kuiper says some things that are a bit doctrinally odd, um, we can read it with charity. We can see that it's um, that it's still within the bounds of, of our church's confession, that kind of stuff. So they have that kind of relationship, I think. Um, that, that works quite well within Kuiper's own way of understanding, you know, what kind of theologians are out there. That's so helpful. It's so helpful to, to think through that relationship. And I love, <clears throat> I love that cold digger Coldsmith uh, relation. <clears throat> so, so moving on to, to, to Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche, oh. however, everyone's pronounced it differently, but uh, you see Bavink is like this, he's this reformed dogmatician and he's expounding the reform faith. He's oh. expounding neo-Calvinism and Calvin's thought for, well, Calvin, you know, uh, really biblical thought by way of Calvin and Augustine to all of life. And he's like the reform dude. But then along comes Nietzsche. Mm -hmm. And it seems like uh, I had just this question. It seems like he's backing off on the intricacies or not the mm -hmm. intricacies, but um, he's moving towards defending Christianity. And he says things like, uh, you know, there's really only two worldviews. There's the, the, the Christian theistic worldview and the not that <clears throat> is did, can you explain um, Nietzsche's influence on the culture at that time the, the Ubermensch and why Bavink would would move more towards uh, the worldview thinking of just theistic worldview and anti-theistic mm -hmm. yeah sure so um, so Friedrich Nietzsche was a German atheist philosopher, uh, writer, who died in 1900. Um, while he was alive, he received very little attention in the Netherlands. Um, the, the only source that I found by Bavink himself where he refers to Nietzsche during Nietzsche's own lifetime shows that I think Bavink at that point also was aware of book titles, but that was it. So mm -hmm. Bavink thought while Nietzsche was still alive that Nietzsche was a kind of... Um, like philosopher of happiness, you know, that, that you exist to be happy. So, you know, do what makes you feel good. Mm. Um, and I think that Bavin got that from the, well, the title of Nietzsche's book, um, The Gay Science, yeah. um, and gain the sense of happy. So, you know, the Dutch title will be The, the Frolike Wissenschaft, um, The Happy Science. And I think, and, and that's not at all the point of Nietzsche's book, actually, if you read it. And, and it's a book of, you know, about very kind of ubermenschy kind of ideas mm -hmm. where you exist to be powerful and dominant rather than just, you know, to be happy by like smelling flowers or, <laughs> you know, skipping through fields or something like that. Um, but I think it looks like from what Baving wrote about it at that point that he probably hadn't read it. He just saw the title and and then assumed, okay, the happy science, the gay science. Um, so it's just a philosophy of how to pursue happiness for yourself, which is, as I said, wasn't at all what Nietzsche was about. So there's not much interest in Nietzsche while he was alive. A little, it picks up a little bit towards the end of Nietzsche's life because people are a bit more aware of the kind of atheism that he was arguing for, but also aware of his own um, um, you know, mental health struggles um, towards the end of his life. And uh, you know, there was one theologian in Kampen who wrote about Nietzsche towards the end of Nietzsche's life, basically saying, "This is, you know, this is where that kind of atheism gets you. It'll make you unhinged, and this is God's judgment on him." Mm. But you still don't find people taking him very seriously or imagining that other people will buy into Nietzsche's ideas. Um, and of course, what makes Nietzsche's atheism very novel is that it, it, it didn't say, you know, we take God out of the picture and the, the rest of the picture is kind of is more or less unchanged, right? So if you remove God from the picture, you have to revalue all values. And actually everything is up for grabs in terms of moral imagination and moral framework. So ethics will all have to be um, Put under the microscope again and we actually don't know what the outcome will be uh, the world will become a very different place so um th so that you know that, that didn't have much traction while nietzsche was still alive but then uh, if you look at um i mean you can do kind of research on this where you look at how often dutch published sources talk about nietzsche and if you go up to 1900 there's almost nothing and then when you start looking at sources after 1900 it just spikes right up mm. and you get dutch novelists who start writing novels that that kind of um further nietzsche's ideas mm. in a recognizably dutch well obviously the language but also kind of frame of reference point culturally so you get something like a cult of nietzsche springing up in Dutch culture, where people buy into the Ubermensch idea, 
And the Übermensch is, is, I mean, literally it means something like the upper person, you know, the dominant one. Mm -hmm. And it's this way of imagining what it means to be human where you don't really care at all about, you know, forgiveness or grace or servanthood or humility. Instead, it's all about the pursuit of power and domination. And it's the idea that, that you will only live once. And if you had to live the life, the one life that you have over and over, would you regret it? And if you would, then you have to put it right in this one life. And of course, the things that you should regret are meekness and weakness mm. and you know, all of the things that Nietzsche thought you see in Jesus, that Jesus gives himself for others, that you know, he intentionally has no place to lay his head, that he hangs around with people who are not socially influential, um, and that he gives himself for them. So Nietzsche really despised Jesus and then thought that the whole of Western culture had gone in the wrong direction because it hadn't seen how much it should hate Jesus of Nazareth. Yeah. And then, so um, that's part of why Bavink then starts to write so much about Christianity as a response to the growth of Nietzsche and atheism in Dutch culture. Um, because Bavink realized that actually, you know, so much of what I've written before has been against other schools of thought theologically. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, Nietzsche hates them just as much as he hates me. And, um, you know, I, I guess the way that I try and describe it in the book is that Bavink thought of Christianity as being as this his historic force that's like a tree that grows up and the root is Jesus. Mm -hmm. um, and all the branches grow off that. Um, and, you know, the branches look very different, but ultimately, you know, they, historically they wouldn't be there without Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they're all in different ways trying to understand Jesus, even if, you know, the different branches say very, very different things about Jesus. Um, but what Bavink saw was that, that the Ubermensch was coming with an axe in his hand and was aiming for the very base of the stump yeah. rather than you know just having pruning shears to chop off a branch or two. So Baving realized that he had to develop some kind of apologetic for Christianity in general and not just be an apologist for neo-Calvinism. Mm -hmm. um, but he didn't give up on neo-Calvinism. And that's the thing that I try and get across in the biography that's quite different to his first Dutch biographer, Valentine, Valentine Hip, because he, he suggests in his biography that Bavink had kind of lost faith in Reformed theology and had given up on it in order to be a more generic Christian. Yeah. Um, but actually, that just doesn't work when you look at the, the Nietzsche and background and also just which books was Bavink writing, because it's like he has a kind of balanced publishing approach where for every book on reform theology, he also has a book that's on you know Christian science, Christian worldview, Christianity, the meaning of Christianity in our time. Um, so there's it's a it's a kind of balancing act now because he knows that if you only defend reform theology, but you don't have a reason to defend Christianity as well in a more generic sense, um, then the Nietzscheans have already undercut you and they pulled the rug out from under your feet. Um, so you have to be able to do both. Yeah. Well, that's that's so helpful to think through. So it wasn't like this turn to a mere Christianity in the C.S. Lewis sense of just the bare bare minimums, but you know he's still doing both simultaneously. And hopefully, those uh, mm -hmm. appreciating his defense of Christianity will come over to the Reformed understanding. Because now that I'm in this Christian camp or, or more undergirded in it, where do I go from here? Oh, there's all these uh, books that I've written on mm -hmm. Reformed Christianity. So come on in. Yep. Yeah, I yeah love it. indeed. And, and in a way, it's the kind of germination of you know, the seed that's there in Reformed Dogmatics as well, because although it's called the Reformed Dogmatics, um, it's actually a very non-sectarian piece mm. of theological writing, um, because his argument, of course, is that you know the Reformed tradition is the one that best articulates the historic Catholic Christian faith. But it's an articulation of the, the faith Catholic rather than just, you know, a kind of narrow sectarian take on things. And you see this, I mean, I argued this actually in Trinitarian Organism, that structurally the dogmatics is set up to follow the Apostles' Creed. Yeah. And it's actually like a massive four-volume exposition of the Creed. Mm -hmm. So his argument really is if you believe the creeds, um, then you should you should be reformed. <laughs> um, but also if you if you are reformed, then really you're you're Catholic and the and he thought the best sense of the word. Yeah. Um so and you know he, he I mean he wrote explicitly once that the goal of of writing dogmatics is something beyond dogmatics and that is the Christian faith. So you, know, so you don't write dogmatics within your tradition um to limit the Christian faith and in, in a kind of small minded way to your tradition, but rather um so that you find your feet within Christianity. Um, so I, I think that actually the direction that he goes in, in balancing out reformed stuff and generically Christian stuff is actually, it, well, it grows out of what's in the dogmatics in the first place. That's huge. That's such a great point. Well, uh, we're going to have to stop here. we got a hard stop. Uh, I would love to have you back on. You said you could talk about ba uh, Bavink all day long, and yeah. I would 
I would love to as well. I'd love to talk, you know, his, his idea of mankind being and becoming so interesting to me. Um, but so open invitation, please, please come back and, and talk more. Thanks. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. This was a real pleasure to talk. I enjoyed it. Yeah, this was definitely uh, one of those uh, dream conversations for me. So I really appreciate it. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies. As always, all glory to God.